Hi guys, it is a gorgeous December day down here in the heart of Texas in the waning days of 2019. And I am Sam Mitchell and this is the latest, the final edition, the final 2019 edition of my Collapse Chronicles conversation. And I cannot think of a, a better person to wrap up uh, this decade than uh, this conversation I'm getting ready to have with a fellow I've mentioned many times on this channel, Dr. William Rees. And if you are not uh, familiar with William Rees, we're getting ready to change that. William Rees holds a doctorate in population ecology and is a bioecologist, an ecological economist, and former director and professor emeritus of the University of British Columbia's School of Community and Regional Planning. His early research focused on environmental assessment but gradually extended to the biophysical requirements for sustainability and the implications of global ecological trends. Rees is perhaps best known as the originator and co-developer with his graduate students of ecological footprint analysis. The expanding human eco-footprint is arguably the world's best known indicator of the unsustainability of techno-industrial society. And I could go on and on with this, guys, but uh, we need to get this man on. So, William Rees, come on and say hello to the folks, and we're going to dive right into this. Uh, good morning, Sam. It's very nice to be with you. I guess it's afternoon where you are. In Thank fact, you. it's afternoon where I am right now too. Just just started. There you go. Okay. Well, we've made it to a we've we've made it to a to another day in uh, in global industrial civilization. So, guys, as I as I promised, William, I'm I'm just gonna I, I'm gonna start this conversation off, and then I am going to step out of character and do everything I can to uh, keep my own mouth shut. And we are going to let William Rees explain to us the mess we are in. We're going to spend a few minutes talking about the mess we have gotten ourselves into here at the opening bell of 2020. And then we're going to spend the uh, remainder of uh, the conversation talking about how we are going to get out of this mess, what we need to do, and whether we're going to be able to do this. And we're going to start with uh, this this uh, phrase that William Rees has introduced on an essay that I shared recently called Humanity's Plague phase. So William Rees, come on, describe to us what humanity's plague phase is and how we're going, how and if we are going to turn that around in the 21st century. The floor is yours. Take it away. Well, it's a very big uh, charge you've left me with. Um, every species, including human beings, is inherently capable of growing exponentially, that is to say, uh, of exploding in an environment where there are plentiful resources and almost nothing to inhibit it. So if you could imagine a single bacterium cell being dropped on a petri dish, in 15 or 20 minutes under ideal conditions, there'll be two cells there. And in another 20 or 15 minutes, there will be four. And give it another 15 or 20 minutes and you'll see eight. And what we're seeing here is the population growing uninhibited because the petri dish is an ideal environment with nutrients, the proper temperature, and all of that sort of thing. And uh, this population will grow at its natural doubling rate for those conditions. Uh, in this case, it might be as little as 15 or 20 minutes. So first of all, exponential growth simply means there's a constant doubling rate. Now, every species has that capacity, but in nature, 
there are a whole variety of what we call negative feedbacks, things that prevent the population from continuously expanding. Uh, disease. Uh, if the population gets too crowded, then disease spreads easily, it'll get shoved back. If the population is too uh, ravenous, it will eat itself out of resources. If the population has predators and it uh, tends to get a little bit too high, then the predators also expand and, and beat back the population. So in nature, there's an uneasy, there's no balance in nature. There's a constant disequilibrium going on among species as each uh, tries to rise to its full potential but gets, but gets back by negative feedback. Now, some species are in very simple habitats. So if we think of Arctic hare and Arctic foxes in, in northern Canada and Alaska, for example, they cycle every 20 years, every 10 years or so. Uh, the hares expand in population. Uh, there's relatively few foxes around. Uh, but because the hares have expanded, the foxes uh, suddenly uh, start reproducing and having high survival rates of offspring. And so there's a population explosion of foxes, and that knocks back the, the hares. So you get this cyclical situation occurring every 10 years in a relatively simple environment. If you go online, you can look for mice in Australia, and you'll see that every few years they explode into unbelievable numbers before getting knocked back. Well, each of those massive explosions results when the Conditions are such that there's no negative feedback. The population for a short period of time, a few generations, comes to realize its full biological potential to double every you know, few years or few months or few hours, as it may be, depending on the species. And when that explosion occurs, it's like a plague. In, in Egypt or North Africa, there are plagues of locusts, and, and we see plagues of various kinds all over the world under these circumstances. Well, humans have never had a plague, uh, a phase that would resemble any of those kinds of explosions until relatively recently. So if you think about modern humans, anatomically modern people that look more or less like us, say Cro-Magnon man, we may go back, what, 200,000 years, some would say 300,000 years. So it took human beings something like 200,000 years to reach 1 billion people. And that occurred early in the 19th century, say 1810 or thereabouts. So 200,000 years to reach just a billion people. And if you think about it, the, the population growth that we experienced for most of that period, certainly the last 50,000 years, was simply humans spreading over the face of the earth. We apparently emerged out of Africa and spread over the rest of, of the planet over a period of some 50 or 60,000 years. So that was the population growth. It wasn't because in any particular place the population was booming. Um, most local populations of people it's oscillated with environmental conditions. They grow for a few decades, but then get slammed back by bad weather or poor food conditions or whatever it might be. Negative feedback would set in. So by about 18, 10 or thereabouts, we'd reached a billion people on the planet. And then something remarkable happened. And I want people to think about this because I'm going to um, get you to think completely differently about everything you have thought about about modern humans. First of all, at 200,000 years to reach 1 billion. Then in just 200 years, listen to me, 200 years, that's one one thousandth as much time, we blew up to 7.5 billion people early in this century. So this is a population explosion. It's because with the advent of oil and our capacity to use abundant cheap energy to, qu to acquire all the other resources that humans need, we overcame food shortages, we overcame uh, resource shortages by new technologies that enable us to exploit everything that we need. We had the means by which to realize our full ecological or biological potential to expand exponentially. And of course, modern medicine helped as well by repressing many diseases that would otherwise have held us in check. So for the first time in our history, human beings 
have entered a phase of population growth remember, uh, resembling the plague phase in the cycles of animals that regularly go through this. So humans are now, in my opinion, in the plague phase of a one-off population cycle because the inevitable result of any plague is a collapse because the plague species occupies its full habitat, uses up all its resources, uh, pollutes its environment, and in other words, undermines the very basis of its own existence. So right now, in the human plague phase, we've got seven and a half billion people with the demographic statistics suggesting we might reach as many as 10 billion people, but we're already on a planet which is crumbling under the human ecological footprint. Humans are in overshoot. The plague phase means overshoot. And overshoot is the expression we use when the species of concern, in this case human beings, is using its environment, uh, using up biologically produced resources, much faster than ecosystems can regenerate. And when it's dumping wastes back into its environment, much more quickly than natural systems and processes can assimilate and recycle those resources. In fact, if you think of it in, in those terms, even climate change, which is everybody's big issue right now, is a waste management problem because the primary human component, the human driver of climate change is carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is the greatest waste by weight of all the industrial economies because we are burning fossil fuel and a byproduct of burning a carbon fuel is carbon dioxide. So right now we are exhibiting all of the symptoms of global overshoot, massive overloading of our waste sinks, climate example I've just given, but we're seeing a huge expansion of dead zones in the ocean, both in size and in number. We're seeing the contamination of all of our inland waterways. We're seeing the contamination of soils. We're seeing the erosion of soils. By some estimates at current rates of soil use, uh, there's only about uh, 25 to 50 or 60 perhaps crop years left. All of this occurring at a time when the population is still expanding at about 1% per year. That's doubling in seven year, uh, 70 years. We won't get there in my view, uh, but we're certainly headed for uh, eight, maybe nine billion people before things start uh, getting really serious. Again then, Human beings are like any other species. We have the biological potential to expand exponentially with a generation time as short as 20 years. And that's basically what's happened to us in the last 200 years. So here we have a rather interesting situation. About 10 generations of human beings out of thousands have experienced sufficient population and material growth in their lifetimes even to notice it happening. Understand what I'm saying. If you went back six or seven hundred years, you could live your entire life and not notice any major change in technology, certainly no change in your material well-being. You might even have seen a population crash if you lived in a European uh, community in, in the Middle Ages. A plague often swept through when population densities got too high and disease as were favorable or was favorable for disease vectors such as the, the, the plague bacterium carried by rats. You, you might lose... 30% or even 50% of the people in your village during a plague of, of that kind. Of course, uh, that's just other species expressing essentially what we're going through right now. So we've had a period then in just the last seven or eight generations since the middle part of the 18th or 19th century, which we have come to accept as normal. So every day we wake up and we hear on the news that the economy is in great shape. It's growing at 2 or 3% per year. Well, that's doubling. That's a doubling rate of once every 35 or 20 years, which is an extreme rate of growth in, in historical terms. And yet we consider this to be the norm. So get me again. We live in one of a very few generations of people who think growth in the economy, growth in population is normal when in fact the period in which we've lived and our grandparents lived and hardly any generations beyond that is the single most abnormal or anomalous period in the history of our species. It's the first time human beings on a global scale have grown so rapidly that we can legitimately say 
we are in what I refer to as the plague phase of a, of a population explosion. It's likely to be a one-off, and uh, I think it, it cannot end well because of the current way we are managing our affairs. So that's what, what I mean by plague phase, Sam. Huh? So there we are. So that that was perfect time. I was to say fifteen minutes, and you it was up to the second, brother. You 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 are good. Okay. So uh, I, again, folks, we could, as I have done in so many other conversations with the people, we could spend the next thirty minutes expanding on the mess that we have made of things now, as we have become officially a plague. On uh, on this planet, but I am going to ask uh, William Reeves to kind of move ahead from here to what I, I consider to be obviously the single most important question uh, of the 21st century, and probably the single most important uh, story that we've been involved in since uh, we climbed down from the trees. Uh, and that is how William Reese, this is a two-part question too, for the next 30 minutes, spend 15 minutes on telling us what do we need to do? What should we do? What would a wise hominid do to turn so we're no longer a plague species? And then what is your honest opinion of whether we're going to rise to the challenge of doing what we need to do to turn this situation around in the 21st century? So take off again, brother. That's a even more complex question than the first one, Sam. Well, what should well, listen, we do? We, we have a real problem as a species because we are unique in, in many ways, and one of them is that we don't actually live in reality. People have the curious property of what we call socially constructing the reality. We create cultural myths. We create cultural, people talk about the cultural narrative and so on. And then we live out of those myths as if they were real. Now, when I say cultural myths, I'm going to extend this to include uh, all kinds of religious ideologies or religious doctrines. They're made up. They're products of the human mind. I know this is going to offend people, but they're products of the human mind. But they have enormous power because people live out of them as if they were true. Many of us are caught up in our political ideologies. In the U.S., of course, it's Republicans and Democrats. And you can see how the country is so incredibly divided over the Trump presidency, for example. Well, both the principles of the Democrats and those of the Republicans are socially constructed. They're made up beliefs, values, and assumptions, but they're so powerful that people live out of them as if they are absolute and the other guys are wrong. In academia, we talk about uh, academic paradigms, theories of one kind or another. Uh, theories, too, are made up social constructs. And some of them are valid and some of them are not. Now, what I'm trying to get at here is that the first thing we have to recognize is that the crisis we are in is a crisis that confronts all of humanity simultaneously. The ecological crisis, or what I call the unsustainability crisis, is a collective problem. And it requires collective solutions, meaning we have to come together in an unprecedented global framework of cooperation to address the problems that confront us all together simultaneously. But when every country, every religion, every linguistic group, every uh, political philosophy is made up different from all of the others, each has its adherents who are so strongly uh, wedded to that particular philosophy that in some cases they'll go out and kill to, to protect it and so on and so forth, you have a hugely difficult problem because it, it's almost impossible to imagine everyone coming together at the same time even to recognize that they have a common problem. And if they do recognize they have a common problem, because they're all starting from different beliefs, values, and assumptions, they're all going to have very, very different approaches to solving that problem. And the collapse of the, the climate talks in Spain this week is a perfect example of that. 
we barely recognize as a species that there is a global climate problem. But even though we've perhaps just gotten to the point of recognizing that, and by the way, the United States does not. President Trump is pulling out of the Paris Accord of 2015 because he does not believe that climate change is real or certainly not a human made. So we haven't even really reached agreement over the nature of that single symptom of the overall crisis of overshoot. And because there's no agreement on the nature of the crisis, uh, we can't come to agreement on what to do about it. And the climate uh, talks uh, fell apart. So my first point is that we have an enormous problem. Um, scientists and, and many who believe in the data as opposed to a particular belief set or ideological perspective, uh, tell us that we have to act in particular ways, but these ways go against the grain. So let me try to expand on that a little bit. What the climate science is saying, oh, I want to make another point here. Everyone is fixated on climate these days, and I have to admit it's an enormous problem in and of itself. But it's really just one symptom of what I talked about earlier, overshoot. So climate change is a symptom of a much more fundamental problem, the human ecological dysfunction that comes out of overshoot and the fact that we're in this plague dynamic of population ex explosion. So from that starting point, uh, we have to understand that, yes, there are things we can do. In theory, this is a solvable problem. For example, in order to maintain global warming to an average of less than one and a half Celsius degrees, we need to cut our carbon emissions by about 50% over the next 10 or 11 years. And we need to decarbonize the economy almost completely by 2050. That's just 30 years or so. So that's what we have to do. You ask me, what do we need to do? Well, to avoid climate change and the consequences that that would bring, which, by the way, includes making much of the world uninhabitable within this century, we need to abandon fossil fuels. Uh, on the other hand, we have a problem. Because, first of all, not everybody believes there is a problem. <laughs> Secondly, we don't have any suitable substitutes for fossil fuels. Now, I made a point some time ago that the human plague phase is largely the result of our having access to abundant, cheap energy. Again, we don't use energy per se. We use the services that energy provides. And energy has provided us with a way to double and double and double again our food supply, to double and double and double again our supply of all the essential minerals to blow up the, or to expand the, the uh, human economy. So it's really fossil fuel that has enabled us to live the way we have so high on the hog for the last uh, 100 years or so. Now, if we cut back on fossil fuels, in the absence of suitable substitutes, all that gravy train comes to an end. We can no longer provide food for seven and a half, let alone 10 billion people. We can no longer continue to mine the countryside and clear the world's forests for the resources we need to grow the human economy. So to abandon fossil fuel in the absence of suitable substitutes, and we can talk about why I don't think we have any just now, is to collapse the economy and to uh, induce social chaos. You see what I'm, we're, we're talking about collapse even though we're talking about the solutions. And yet, if we don't abandon fossil fuel, and that's precisely what the world decided to do this past weekend in, in, <laughs> with the collapse of the climate thing, then we're confronted with, right now we're on track for as much as three Celsius degrees warming. That's over five degrees Fahrenheit warming. Now, that doesn't seem like very much. But it's not as if it's an average that occurs everywhere at the same time. Northern Canada has already experienced well over five degrees of Fahrenheit warming. And it's resulting in the meltdown of the permafrost and massive releases of additional carbon dioxide and, and uh, methane, which is accelerating global warming. So it's, it's a kind of a positive feedback effect. So five degrees is catastrophic. If we had a five Fahrenheit degree increase or a three uh, Celsius degree increase in mean global temperature, it would mean the abandonment of vast areas of the planet Earth where millions and millions of people now live and uh, would be unable to live because it becomes too hot, cities become uninhabitable, uninhabitable, 
uh, food production becomes problematic, and so on and so forth. So on a three degrees Celsius warming track, which we're clearly on right now, uh, then we risk seeing hundreds of millions of people in trans transmigration, abandoning landscapes, abandoning cities by the end of this uh, uh, century. And certainly that would result in massive geopolitical disruption and likely the collapse of the global system. So I call what I've just described the climate energy conundrum. On the one hand, if we abandon our energy supplies, we wreck the economy and collapse into social chaos. On the other, if we don't abandon fossil fuels, we wreck the economy and collapse into social chaos. So we've got to find some kind of ground in between these solutions. And, and I don't know, Sam, whether you want me to get into why uh, solar energy and wind energy really aren't the solution. Oh, yeah, definitely take, take a, a, a rip on that one for a few minutes. Because so many people... Uh, <laughs> as you know, think that even the people who do realize we have a problem are going down the rosy path that this is the, so that the Green New Deal is the solution to it. So it sounds like you're not on that gravy train. I, I'm simply, I'm not convinced for a whole variety of reasons. And in fact, we could take three or four hours without let's, even scratching let's, let's the surface of that one. seven or eight minutes. Well, okay, let me, let, let me start in the simplest possible way. Right now, the world is convinced of the need to main, maintain economic and population growth. That's our track. I talked earlier about the social construction of reality. The current socially constructed, uh, what we would call our, our dominant cultural narrative, is utterly dependent on the idea of perpetual economic growth and rising material standards aided and abetted by unlimited technological developments. So within the economic discipline, for example, most economists believe that if market forces are allowed to function, then the dynamics of, of price and supply will work in such ways to, to stimulate uh, people's initiative when, when prices go high, and they'll find substitutes for any resource that we run out of. And I'll just give you one example. Um, I mentioned earlier that there may only be a maximum of 50 or 60 years of soil left on Earth. Economists would say it doesn't matter. We've got um, fertilizer. It's a human invention, a construct of the mind that replaces the soil. So don't worry about it. But of course, we have to remember that fertilizers are all byproducts of the fossil fuel sector. So we're into another little double bind there. But the point is, we have right now an ideology running the whole planet a neoliberal economic ideology that suggests that there's no problem because if the market functions properly, we're going to see human ingenuity find substitutes for any resource so we can keep the gravy train growing. Growth, growth, growth. Okay, let's get back to the energy question. We have seen stellar increases in the amount of solar and wind energy being installed around the planet. People talk about the 20 and 25 percent increase just last year. Well, keep in mind that if you start from nearly zero, a 25 percent increase isn't very much in total quantitative terms. So if we look at the last year for which good numbers are available, the increase in demand for electricity on the planet, this is just the increase, which was, I think, two or three percent, exceeded the entire output of all the solar installations put in place in the last 40 or 50 years. So as long as you are in a growth mode and the amount of increase in demand exceeds the total output of solar energy, solar energy by definition can never catch up. And by the way, if you add the wind power to the solar power, the, the, both of them together after some 40 odd years of, of a steady increasing rapid development still only supply about three and a half or four percent of the world's total energy budget. And it's cost trillions of dollars. You do the math and ask yourself whether it's likely, even in economic terms, assuming the technologies were perfect, to make the kinds of investments in the next 10 to 20 years needed to have solar and wind power uh, replace all fossil fuel use. Keep in mind, too, I mentioned a moment ago, that the increase in demand annually 
for electricity alone exceeds the total output of, of solar power. And by the way, if you throw wind in, it just takes two years of the increase in demand of world electricity to wipe out the total contribution of wind and solar together. I mean, I'm not talking about the annual increments of wind and solar. I'm talking about the entire installed base of wind and solar. Okay, so they are not catching up, not keeping up to the growth. So you first of all, you've got to abandon growth if you want to have a hope of replacing any significant amount of fossil energy with alternatives. Secondly, 84% of our primary energy today is provided by fossil fuel. Only 20% is electricity. So wind and solar provide up to 20% of our energy supply, or not 20%, I say electricity supplies up to 20% of our energy supply. But even if you replaced all of our um, electricity with wind and solar electricity, which we're nowhere near close to doing, you haven't yet accounted for the other 80% of the energy, which is not readily convertible to um, uh, these kinds of alternatives. It's ironic in some respects that if you look at Germany, uh, which is way, way ahead of the game in, in, in among industrial countries in, in the installations of wind and solar, the single largest supplier of green energy in Germany is still wood, or at least biomass. So biomass is right up there with wind and solar, despite the vast developments and rapid growth of the latter. The point I'm getting at is that in a growth dynamic, in the period of time that we have available, it is simply not arithmetically possible for wind and solar to do an adequate replacement to a fossil fuel, even in the electricity sector, never mind the rest of the economy, the other 80% of the economy, which does not operate on electricity. It's just not going to happen. So if we're going to resolve the crisis, it's not going to be through the substitution of any of the currently available alternative technologies for fossil fuel. And there's something else to keep in mind here. And that is that even if, let's just suppose that I'm completely wrong in everything I've just spent the last 10 minutes saying. If I am completely wrong and we find an absolute substitute in quantity and quality for fossil fuel so that we can keep the gravy train going, it still means we're headed to collapse. And the reason is, this is just one symptom of our problem. The energy thing, just as climate is one symptom of our problem. If the human species continues to use any form of abundant cheap energy in the same profligate way that we have in the past to exploit every ecosystem on Earth, to scour the planet of, of, of resources, to, to fish out the sea, to destroy the soils and so on and so forth, it's still an end game as far as we're concerned. So we have to back off. Sam. We have to back off to enable the ecosystems upon which we are utterly dependent in the final analysis to recover, to begin to regenerate. We have to back off to enable the uh, clarifier, the, the, the purifying processes of natural systems rid themselves of the toxic contamination that the industrial uh, economy has imposed upon them, and so on. If we're not willing to do that, I don't think we, we, there's much point in having the discussion. Okay, so that's my rip on, on energy. It's just not, in my view, arithmetically possible and probably not even technologically possible that we find a substitute for the abundant fossil fuels that have brought us to this stage and certainly not in current uh, levels of wind and solar technology. By the way, there's even other factors. All of our wind and solar equipment, the infrastructure and, and the wind turbines and solar panels themselves are manufactured using what? Fossil, Fossil fuel. fuel energy. And so even the alternative energy sector is ultimately de dependent on fossil energy. Moreover, uh, if you look at the history of wind power in Europe, the average life expectancy of a typical wind turbine is turning out to be on the order of 15 years, sometimes less, sometimes a little bit more. Now, a single wind turbine may contain, depending on the conditions under which it's built, the size of the turbine itself, but there will be hundreds of tons of steel. There will be a couple of thousand tons of concrete. There will be, uh, well, 
50 to 100 tons of unrecyclable plastics in each windmill. So that all of that has to be replaced, not all of it, but most of it, every 20 years with fossil fuel. So again, since it's not even a renewable energy source, it's a, re, I suppose, a replaceable energy source of some kind, it needs to be remanufactured, rebuilt, and put back in place every uh, 15 to 20 years, depending on which of the technologies you're talking about. Moreover, those technologies are hugely demanding of rare earth metals, so that the mining of the planet, the destruction of the planet that results from mining, let's put it that way if we can, since we're already in overshoot, will increase many hundred to a thousand fold as a result of our frantic efforts uh, to build out our solar technologies and wind technologies uh, to replace fossil fuels. And keep in mind, again, we're trapped in this growth thing. The United Nations estimates that something like two and a half billion people will be added to cities in the, well, in, in the first half of this century, let us say. But just to build out those cities, which are largely built of concrete and steel, would use up our entire carbon budget that would put us over the top in terms of, of, of the climate dilemma. So what we're confronted with here is what every species in a plague stage has to confront. We live in a finite environment. It's called planet Earth. Everything in the human system, from our bodies to our automobiles, is made out of materials extracted from that planet Earth. The planet isn't getting any bigger. And in fact, we can honestly say that the ecosphere is getting smaller because we're eroding it, we're consuming it, we're converting it to all of the infrastructure of our bodies and so on and so forth. We are literally converting the earth to the human system and in the process undermining our own future because we depend on that earth system to maintain the life support functions upon which we, we all exist. So we know what we need to do. The second question is, well, are that, we able... Well, yeah, but I, I, before, but, but I, I'm not going to let you get out quite this easily. Uh, now, uh, William uh, Reese has, has written quite a bit, and, and I actually shared this recently here on Collapse Chronicles, on his specific list of recommendations in two recent, well, one recent essay in Post Carbon Institute and one that's going to be coming out in a few months in sciencedirect.com. On his list of things we need to do, I, I notice, William, you've put it at the bottom of both of these lists, uh, but at least you have it on the list, which is more than I can say of 99% of people uh, who have had the courage to do this. So I'm going to read from an essay that will be published in March. The last thing on your list of things that we need to do, this is verbatim from, from your writings, conceive and implement a global fertility strategy to reduce the human population to the two billion plus or minus people that might be able to live in material comfort on this already much damaged single planet Earth. There you go, brother. You you have taken a stand with that. That is probably a good thing you're towards the end of your career because you might have just sort of killed it if you had been a younger man saying that. Tell us what that's going to look like. What What is your vision of this population conceiving and implementing a global fertility strategy to reduce the human population to two billion people? <laughs> Okay, let, let's back up a bit here. Uh, you, you, you know, when you said I stuck my neck out here, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the population question has a, been a forbidden topic for decades now, uh, probably going back to the first United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. There was a kind of an uneasy, under-the-table agreement going into that, in, that uh, conference. This is the, the famous Rio de Janeiro conference in 1992 that if we in the northern developed countries did not mention population growth, which mostly occurs in southern less developed countries, at least at that time, uh, if we didn't mess around with the population question, then the, the, the developing countries wouldn't bother us 
about our excess consumption. So there was an agreement. <laughs> Amazingly, here we got this major, the first major global conference on environment and development. The two drivers are population and consumption. So the human impact on Earth is a product of the population, the number of people times the average per capita consumption. And yet, as an agreement before we get into the meeting, we're not going to talk about either of those things directly. Everything became an indirect reference to them. And ever since then, it's impolite to raise the population <laughs> question. Well, I think that's a gross error, uh, precisely because we're in the plague phase. And if we don't deal with the population question, all other bets are off. I, that's why I'm, for years now, I've been saying that we really need this global population fertility strategy. By the way, again, the United States is absolutely opposed to this kind of thing and is withdrawing aid from organizations that promote family planning in, in developing countries and so on. So again, it goes back to this competing sets of values, beliefs, and assumptions about the nature of the reality in which we find ourselves. Now again, in theory, this wouldn't be difficult to achieve. You could achieve a population reduction to the uh, sustainable level within a few generations, a couple of generations, simply by stopping having children or limiting all families to one uh, fa uh, child at the, at the most by promoting family planning around the world. But for that to happen, you need a complete paradigmatic mind change in many religions who regard the numbers of children as, as an indication of, of, of well-being, of, of economic, and even for that matter, physical prowess. So we've got a huge conflict on our hands. We don't agree that there's a population problem, and if we do, we don't agree on how to resolve it. So theoretically, it's easy. The technology's there. there. Um, the science, if you believe what I've been saying, is there to suggest it's necessary, but we have neither the will nor the collective motivation to acknowledge the problem, uh, let alone put in place the kinds of strategic motive, uh, actions rather that would enable us to achieve this. So my concern, my fear is that just as any other species that goes into plague phase um, depletes its environment, uh, we will do the same. On our present trajectory, we will crash, and it won't be a very pleasant crash. So in many respects, the, the choice between us is to get real, is to come to uh, some kind of a global agreement and, and to try to promote that agreement among those who, who believe in it, and to plan a controlled, uh, reasonably soft landing, or to let nature take course, and it will be exceedingly unpleasant indeed, and might even ultimately, because of the vast migrations of displaced people and so on and so forth that we can anticipate by the end of the century, lead to the kind of geopolitical instability that leads to a nuclear conflagration. We keep forgetting that that's still something that hangs over our head and has been doing for the last about 75 years or so. Hello. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Uh, I, 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 I'm. I'm here, uh, <laughs> cheer, cheering you on, brother. You know, f for years I, I have just been making the point, and every time I make this point, I, I, I'm just greeted with total silence. That all of these solutions that I am seeing are coming from the supply side. It's just automatically understood that there are going to be 10 billion people on this planet and all of the great minds of the world are talking about how we are going to address this from the supply side that it is that it is a given we're going to at least 10 billion we mm. need to figure out how to supply the energy food housing and whatnot to 10 billion people and nobody is talking about approaching it from the demand side by reducing the demand on this on this planet by reducing the number of, of, of people uh, ma making the demands, and uh, I'm glad to see you are, are at least raising that little bit, uh, <laughs> that, that little flag. I mean, you, it's a big flag. Let's yeah. face it, this it, is a big a flag, flag, but, but nobody's raising let, it. 
let, let's be fair here too. We have to recognize, you know, my, I said we could live maybe with two billion people in material comfort. That would be at roughly Western European lifestyles. It's not hard really to think about how to come up with that kind of number. That's what my ecological footprint system does. Uh, I've developed this with various students, including Matisse Wackernagel, for example, who's now the president and runs so competently something called the Global Footprint Network. But what we argue is, is really very simple. If you were to show me, Sam, the annual, your annual shopping basket, this is all the stuff that Sam Mitchell consumes in a year. We can plug that into our uh, method now and it will show you the amount of land on the face of the earth needed to produce all of the uh, bio resources all the food supplies the biological fiber you know wool cellulose and so on and so forth that that you use in an annual on an annual basis and it will also show how much land is needed in the form of growing forest as a carbon sink for the carbon dioxide emissions that you use either directly or in the production of the things that you consume. So it's it's not too difficult. A lot of numbers involved, but we have a method that enables us to compute the area of productive ecosystems on the surface of the earth needed to sustain an individual or a city or a country at its current material standard. So when we do that, we find that the average North American uses about seven hectares. Now, a hectare is, what, 2.47 acres, so seven hectares is getting pretty close to 20, uh, 20 acres per person. That's what we need to produce all the resources that we consume per capita and to assimilate our mostly carbon wastes. On planet Earth today, by contrast, there are only about 1.8 hectares of that kind of productive habitat. So on Earth today, if you divide the total productive land and water base of planet Earth by 7.7 billion people, your fair share, if we were to do this on a strictly fair allocative basis, would be 1.8 productive hectares. And again, multiply that by two, two and a half and you get the number of acres. So the average available, 1.8, the average in North American uses seven. So if everybody lived the way we do in North America, with our very, very high levels of consumption, we'd need four or so additional planets. And that's why I say we're in overshoot. If we go to the poorest people on Earth, they use far less than a hectare, less than a, an acre even. So from their perspective, they're not getting nearly their fair share. And one of the reasons is globalization and trade. We've just signed another big trade deal here in, in North America. But what trade does is enable the richest people in the world, and there's more and more of them every year, to gain market access to all the world's now depleting remaining pockets of biological assets. So we get the best fish, we get the best coffee, we get the best beef, we get the best, 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 and best, and best, and the poor go to hell in a handcart. So we have two problems here. Vast overconsumption by people in North, where countries, even in Europe, they're using the equivalent of, of three planet Earths per year, three or four planet Earths, we're using five or six here in North America, while other people on Earth are using less than their fair share of one planet. So we need to really consider two things here. Massive changes in lifestyle so that we need far less consumption and massive changes in our ways of produce, uh, approaching the population question. So if we reduce the population to 2 billion people, we could live each on about the equivalent of, say, 5 hectares of land and water, and that's roughly what uh, Europe lives on, on today. Some people think that even that's vastly too much. Some estimates uh, are as low as a few hundred million people would be the carrying capacity of the planet. And, of course, there are completely crazy, in my view, economists who would argue that there's no limits on human population growth and Earth could easily support a trillion people. So there you have it. It's your choice. Do you think we can support a few hundred million or as many as a trillion? That's a thousand millions uh, or a thousand. It's just inc it's incredible. A thousand billions, actually. Yeah.
so uh, we, we're we're sitting here, good Lord. We are going on to the, the just the last few minutes. So obviously, what you are brushing up against, and I, I need to get your opinion, being the the ecological footprint guy uh, more than anybody else. I've probably asked this question to individual consumer and lifestyle choices. You know, once again, here we are again, the, the average person listening to this, uh, to this uh, interview, what can I do as an individual to make any difference uh, in, in, in what's unfolding on this planet in the 21st century, and then we will wrap it up. So give your five-minute spin on this conundrum. Well, Sam, this is a terrifically important question because there's a hundred books out there on what you can do to avoid the environmental crisis. And the sad fact of the matter is that um, even if everyone did what they could do, as individuals, it might not make that much difference. Some estimates are as little as 2% and some are as much as 10%. But the point is that this is not an individual problem. And there's any number of reasons for that, but I'll mention two. First of all, not everybody's going to do it. You know very well. You, you're in Texas. There are people down there, including George H.W. Bush, who stood up uh, one time in the 90s and slammed his fist on the table and said, the North American, or rather the American way of life is not up for negotiation. That was all about the, the uh, real conference on environment and development. And that was a, a, an expression of the God-given right of Americans or whomever it might be to consume every damn thing that they want to. If I've got the money, then don't give me any hassle of what kind of car I drive or how much gas I use and so on and so forth. That is a very prominent attitude still in the world today. So that if I, as a, uh, an ecologist who believes in what I'm saying, change my lifestyle radically and reduce my footprint down to the global average, uh, then I take a huge hit in a sense. But if everybody else keeps believing that their way of life is not up for negotiation, they simply yeah, use up whatever I don't. And this is, this is called the public good problem, because if I make the big sacrifice, I'm giving the world the gift of the potential benefits of my lower consumption. Uh, but the problem is I suffer all the costs and only a very tiny share of those benefits. And if nobody else fell, follows, I lose completely. So that's the dilemma that individuals face. Why should I do this if nobody else does? So again, I come back to the point, yes, it would be nice, and technically speaking, if everybody did this, this, and this, we could reduce our eco footprints by, say, 10%. But the heavy lifting is still a collective question. So I, as an individual, cannot shift from my private automobile to rapid transit in my city if my city doesn't provide rapid transit. Rapid transit is a public policy decision to create economic incentives to get people out of their cars into rapid transit has to be a public policy decision. Any policy to implement a, a global population strategy has to be agreed upon globally as a collective decision in the interests of all humanity, not just a few individuals. If I want to impose a carbon tax that actually makes a difference, or a cap-and-trade system that actually makes a difference. That's a public policy decision. It has to be taken in Washington or Ottawa or London on behalf of the common good. And, you know, we, we've, it's absolutely clear that that's what has to happen. But what's happened in the last 40 years as, as neoliberalism has swept the world, we don't hear about the common good. We don't hear about the public interest anymore. It's all about the rights of the individual, the market shall prevail, and the world will uh, you know, bow before the, the god of, of the economy as opposed to the interests of humanity as a whole. So again, it gets back to the social construction of reality. When I was a kid growing up in, in, in this country, in, in, I'm in Canada, uh, political dialogue, elections were won on the basis of what was in the public interest. That's how we got national health care. That's how we got national um, employment insurance and so on and so forth. Those are public good questions in the public interest. We all share the benefits. 
in, in our collective pooling of assets uh, to better society as a whole. But over the last 40 or 50 years, we've seen the gradual erosion of the concept of the public good or the public interest, and it's been taken over by the primacy of the individual and the rights of individuals to do whatever they damn well please in a market society, and it's all those individuals making decisions in the marketplace that will determine the fate of the world. And then unfortunately, people making individual decisions to get a bigger car, bigger house, and so on and so forth, that's what's killing us. It's interesting that, you know, in North America, everybody in the 50s and 60s, a brand new house was about a thousand square feet. A family size was maybe three and a half. Today, the average new house is 2,500 square feet. That's 150% bigger. Family size is reduced to two or a little bit. So the average base per capita has increased by 150% or something like that. And uh, we, we still call those sustainable houses because the insulation is 50% better or something. It's an absurdity. We've got our minds working uh, against us because we keep convincing ourselves of myths of social constructs that bear no relationship to reality. Okay, and I, 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 uh, as, as, as much as I'm loving this, we, we're <laughs> going to collapse in four minutes. So, uh, so William reads, as I do with every one of my guests, and for the final time of uh, 2019, I am going to ask this question. If you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles for one hour, but you had the mainstream media... Uh, giving you 60 seconds to give the William Rees message warning to humanity at the closing bell of 2019, what would your 60-second soundbite sound like? It, it would be really quite simple. Human beings are driven biological entities, but we have one thing that other species don't have, and that is this alleged high intelligence, our capacity to reason based on evidence before us. And all we need to do, if we really want to survive, the fact that we are in a plague phase and destroying our own habitat, is to allow our intelligence, to allow our science for once to override our natural instincts to expand and to override our natural instincts uh, to pound our chests and, and want to be better than everybody else and to recognize that as a species, we will not survive this unless we get together, recognize we have a collective problem that requires a collective solution. And if we don't do that, we will crash. I have no doubt whatsoever in my mind, and it won't be uh, necessarily the uh, pleasant experience that um, could happen should we decide to make this a controlled descent. Okay, I cannot think of a better way to wrap up uh, a year of interviews on Collapse Chronicles. Now, William, stick around after we, we wrap this up here in a minute so we can talk. But, folks, we are getting ready to collapse here. So, uh, if you enjoyed this uh, interview, by all means, please spend a few seconds to thumb it up or thumb it down if you did not enjoy it. And please feel free to subscribe. And the last thing I can say is, William Reese, we really appreciate you taking an hour out of your busy schedule. But more importantly, we appreciate the last 50 years, at least, of what you have been doing to bring this message out. And as we head into 2020, keep up the good fight. It's my pleasure, Sam. Thank you. Happy 2020, guys. See you next year.